major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you. People who were forced out of their homes by January's floods will soon have to return home or find a new place to live. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. San Diego County is telling recipients of its emergency temporary lodging program that they have between seven days and a little bit more than five weeks before their hotel vouchers expire. KPBS reporter Melissa May checks back in with a woman who lost both her home and business on January 22nd. The January flooding made Jackie Jo Lopez's Barrio Logan home uninhabitable and destroyed her flower business. We're getting help, but I feel like I'm being stuck and I need to move on. My company, my small business is devastated. Lopez, her mother who is disabled, and Pop Paquito received hotel vouchers from San Diego County. They are currently in their third hotel in Chula Vista. It's been very challenging because they're moving me constantly and every time I move, I lose documentation, um, a lot of my personal property, <clears throat> it's been lost. Lopez has been trying to get help from FEMA, but is currently in limbo with her insurance company. She says she has renter's insurance with State Farm and her claim is still pending, waiting for a plumber's report from her landlord to confirm the damage. You know, I want to do what's right, and that's what I pay my insurance for. So that's the situation where I'm in. We, don't, we do not have a kitchen or no bathroom. State Farm said they could not respond to KPBS's questions about Lopez's claim due to consumer privacy. The county has notified Lopez that she can stay in her hotel room for two more weeks. She is one of hundreds of voucher recipients being notified this week about the status of their temporary housing. The county says there are three tiers of voucher recipients. Households who have not contacted FEMA for help are being given seven days to do so before losing their vouchers. A second has been notified that it's safe to return to their homes, have two weeks. A third group has until May 11th. I've been quite upset and, and, and to be honest, depressed about the situation. But I, I try to smile and keep my head up high. And, you know, besides everything that's going on. FEMA says they've received almost 6,700 applications and approved nearly 2,400 for a total of $18 million in aid. The agency has denied about 1,000 applications due to lack of damages. FEMA spokesperson Maria Padron says if flood victims get denied assistance, they should ask why. Maybe we're, need, we're needing to see some documentation, they forgot to sign a paper, or they didn't keep the appointment with the inspector. The inspector is going to call a person up to three times. The deadline to reach out to FEMA is April 19th to receive any financial assistance. Melissa May, KPBS News. More money is available to those struggling to find permanent housing after January's flooding. Today in Southcrest, local representatives from the National Association of Realtors announced a new pro grant program. Applicants can receive money to cover one month of rent or mortgage up to $2,900. One of the flood victims who was there today says money helps, but there are other obstacles people like him are dealing with. We got funds from FEMA for rental assistance, you know, but unfortunately right now people are asking three times the amount of rent, your, your credit score, or, or, you know, I'm on Section 8, I'm having trouble too, you know, because they, either they don't accept Section 8 or they haven't heard about Section 8. Those interested should apply for the Realtor Relief Program. More information is at PSAR.org. Well, let's look a little bit ahead in time for tonight. We're dropping down to a low of 52 and we'll have clear skies. It really is not a bad forecast here throughout the middle of the week, but we do have changes on the way as we are tracking our next round of rain and gusty winds. You're going to want to tune in for this. 
The deadly bridge collapse in Baltimore is having a ripple effect in Washington. Rebuilding it and reopening the port of Baltimore will take an enormous effort and federal funding. But as Julie Benbrook reports, some members of Congress are already pushing back. Crews at the site of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore are making progress as they work to remove a portion of the wreckage. A massive cargo vessel slammed into the bridge last Tuesday, killing six construction workers. President Joe Biden pledged the full support of the federal government in the response and recovery efforts shortly after the collapse. This administration will be with the people of Baltimore every step of the way. We are with you, Baltimore, and we will be there uh, until, until we get this done. The U.S. Department of Transportation released $60 million to Maryland from an emergency relief fund last week, but the recovery will cost much more. The White House may need Congress to act, and some Republicans Republicans are already voicing their concerns. You know, the first reaction, in fact, the only reaction just tends to be to spend. I still have Florida farmers from a hurricane a year and a half ago that still aren't getting relief. So the federal government is a partner. Uh, the federal government needs to be uh, be a partner, uh, but we need to stop playing politics, and that's exactly what the Biden administration has done. Democratic lawmakers from Maryland are responding to the criticism. Uh, if you go back uh, to the time of the Minneapolis bridge uh, collapse, Congress within a very short period of time uh, overwhelmingly uh, said the federal government uh, should help. And so we believe that we should come together again as Americans, put aside you know, party labels and get it done. President Joe Biden is scheduled to visit Baltimore on Friday to survey damage from the bridge collapse. Reporting at the White House, I'm Julia Benbrook. By this time next year, Florida could be one of the most lenient states for abortion or one of the strictest. Its high court is letting voters decide. Two rulings from the court lay out diverging plans. The first lets a six-week ban take effect May 1st. But a ballot measure this November would override that law by enshrining abortion rights into the state constitution. We don't think it's a choice. A child is not a choice, right? A child is a gift. We're not saying that anybody has to ideologically align with abortion. We're saying that politicians shouldn't be the determiners of that decision. Right now, Florida is one of seven states with abortion bans between 6 and 18 weeks. Florida's attorney general argues the ballot item is unclear and therefore should be invalid. California lawmakers are trying to strengthen protections against doxing, publishing someone's personal information online with the intent to harm. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen looked at a new bill that would let victims sue. Thank you for joining us here today to announce new legislation to support uh, victims of online doxing. Doxing started as a niche tactic among computer hackers in the 90s. Now, researchers estimate it affects millions of Americans. Doxers publish someone's private information online, like their address or social security number, to expose them to harassment and even threats of physical harm. San Diegan Kathy Molig, a trans youth advocate, says her work made her a target. My family and I have felt the chilling effects of doxing firsthand. We have experienced sleepless nights, the anxiety, the overwhelming sense of vulnerability, but we refuse to be silenced by fear. An Anti-Defamation League survey found most doxing attacks are hate-based. They target protected identities like sexual orientation, gender, or religion. It's already a crime. But the bill's co-sponsor, Assemblymember Chris Ward, says it can be hard to prosecute. The Doxing Victims Recourse Act will provide deterrence for doxing activity in the first place, but where it happens, it will hold offenders accountable and allow victims of the, uh, for the opportunity to get their lives back on track after a traumatic experience. This new act would give victims a way to seek civil justice damages up to $30,000 and legal costs. Thank Katie Hayson, KPBS News. One of the key figures in the creation of Petco Park has died. Larry Lucchino was 78 and was battling cancer. Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred praised Lucchino today, calling him one of the most accomplished executives in baseball history. His legacy includes the creation of new stadiums in Baltimore and San Diego. Lucchino served as team president of the Padres in the late 90s and later the Boston Red Sox. He was inducted into the Padres Hall of Fame in 2022.
San Diego wants a lot more high-density housing in University City. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the city is out with a new draft update to the University Community Plan. University City is a major employment hub, but the neighborhood has nowhere near enough housing to accommodate its workforce, meaning most people who work there have to commute long distances. The University Community Plan update envisions more dense apartment buildings, some of the densest housing outside of downtown, especially around the neighborhood's six trolley stations. UCSD student Leanna Cortez says that's more sustainable and inclusive than the status quo. We have the UC San Diego Blue Line now connected in University City, which I feel like has been a great investment. And so I think this plan really capitalizes on that by having development oriented near those options, which from a student perspective and just like a young professional um, University City perspective, I think it allows a lot of people that have been priced out um, of University City to potentially like come back. The draft zoning plan still restricts most of the south of the neighborhood to single-family homes. That was a concession to homeowners who fiercely opposed a proposal to allow townhomes in the area. The city is proposing to allow apartment buildings up to 100 feet in two areas of Southern University City. The volunteer group Help Save UC had hoped for stricter regulations on density, height, and parking. The group told KPBS in a statement, quote, Help Save UC is disappointed that the city appears to have rejected all of our proposals after several years of engagement despite claiming to desire community input. Cortez says many UCSD students were excluded from the planning process. We try to humanize uh, the struggle of students as well. And shouted down and dismissed at community meetings that were dominated by homeowners. The public has until April 29th to comment on the draft University Community Plan update. You can find it at planuniversity.org. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Today, National City Council is expected to introduce a bill to curb its growing homeless population. The proposed ordinance prevents people from camping on public property from 5.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. when shelter beds are available. It would also prevent camping on public property regardless of shelter bed availability if it is within two blocks of a school in a waterway or a transit hub. Before enforcement, police would have to let the person know how many shelter beds are available and offer one to them. If the ordinance passes, it will take effect 30 days from its approval. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announces a major rule change on the nation's rail network. Here's Laura Aguirre on what the federal government is doing to protect employees and the larger community. America's rails are safer today than they were yesterday. Safer because a new rule requiring at least two workers on every train goes into effect Tuesday, a move applauded by DC's Firefighters Association. When train lengths are approaching three miles, relying on just one single crew member is a recipe for disaster. First responders often rely on rail crew workers to give them critical hazardous cargo or mechanical information when they arrive on scene. These crew members are the first line of defense until we arrive. Secretary Pete Buttigieg says last year alone, seven rail workers were killed while on duty, and nearly four dozen suffered major injuries. In February of 2023, a derailed train carrying hazardous materials in East Palestine, Ohio, burned for days, leaving the surrounding communities mired in health, environmental, and political fallout to this day. More than 1,500 derailments have occurred since the East Palestine incident. For years, rail industry lobbyists have been successful in pushing back on the two worker rule at the state level. The railroad lobby said the federal government should be the one to make the rule so that there's uniformity across state lines. So here we go. Additionally, the DOT has conducted thousands of inspections on high hazard rails and crossings, issued new safety policies related to tanker cars, and improved benefits for many union workers, like paid sick days. And we are going to keep pressing Congress to pass the Railway Safety Act. I'm Laura Aguirre for KPBS News. Starting this month, the cities of Oceanside and Vista will be getting their power from CEA or the Clean Energy Alliance. But as KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne explains, that doesn't mean San Diego Gas and Electric is going away in those cities. Oceanside and Vista are the next two cities to join the Clean Energy Alliance, a community choice energy program. But customers won't notice a big change.
because their bill will still be coming from SCG&E. But what will be different is that CEA is providing the energy procurement and we're offering a greater market of renewable and greenhouse gas free energy options to customers. It's nothing new to San Diego. Back in 2019, two agencies were formed, San Diego Community Power for the Greater San Diego Region and Clean Energy Alliance serving North County. Through these organizations, the members have a say in what kind of power they'd like their cities and residents to have. SCG&E delivers the power, maintains the towers, and bills customers. Each of the cities has determined what their minimum power, um, what types of power their, their residents are going to get. Each of the cities has decided that every their residents, as a default, should have 75% clean energy which means that some of it's renewable, a whole lot's renewable, and some of it is uh, carbon free like hydro. Dave Drucker is the chair of CEA and the mayor of Del Mar. At this point, it's almost 75% of the energy that we are providing throughout the North County is 75% clean, which compared to SDG&E has been closer to 39% in the past. So we are having a huge impact on the ability to get clean energy to people that are actually using the energy. The switch is part of longer term plans. One has to do with climate action goals and future funding. So by having clean energy, we are going to be giving all the members the ability to meet their climate action goals. And that becomes very important because eventually funding is going to, from the state and federal government and the county, is going to be based upon meeting your climate action goals. The other has to do with profits coming back into the community. The difference with CEA is that instead of the revenues going back into an investor-owned utility, those revenues are part of a public budget that the community gets to decide how they're invested in the future. Melinda says profits can be used to build more local energy resources like solar farms. Well, let's break down your weather headlines as we head throughout this week. We're going to be tracking a lot of changes. First on our list, it's going to be dry with warming through Wednesday. Get out and enjoy this while you can. I know this past weekend wasn't too great. If you did have any outdoor plans these next few days, this is when you get to, you need to get outside if you do like any outdoor plans. Second on our list, it's cooler and windy though by the later half of the week, which is why I'm stressing that today and even tomorrow are going to be your days if you do want to get out and about, though it is going to be turning wet as well as that cool down approaches and those winds start to pick up and we're even tracking some mountain snow as well. Now for tonight, we are dropping down along the coast to the upper 40s, low 50s there. Ramona, you're at 43, Brago Springs 52, Mount Laguna 37, and as we head into tomorrow, Ooh, it is going to be a little toasty there in Brago Springs with a high of 86. Not too bad, but certainly we're feeling that warm up. Mount Laguna, you're at 53. San Diego, 67. And Oceanside, 68. Now, by Thursday, this is when our next storm approaches. And that's going to really pick up those winds as well, especially Thursday into Friday. I do want to take us over the next few days with your five-day outlook here along the coast. Sunshine for for Wednesday with a high of 68 and then we drop down by Thursday cooler we'll even see a few clouds and by Friday it's going to be rainy at times but thankfully we do start to dry out for the weekend and the temperatures will start to rebound further inland well it's rinse and repeat a very similar story look at that drop off from Wednesday to Friday as that storm makes its way in we are dealing with a few showers on Friday highs drop back down to the 50s though we are back up to the 60s as we head into the weekend as for the mountains a very similar story here we have winds increasing by Thursday. It is going to be quite gusty and as we head into Friday it is going to be very windy and we're even tracking some snow. 
high just 26. So big changes from Wednesday where we are in the mid 50s. We're going to be dropping down to the 20s by Friday. So I hope you didn't put away some of that heavier winter gear yet. We are still talking about cooler conditions, but we do start to warm up again as we head throughout the weekend. A similar story there in the deserts. It is going to be windy and cooler as we head into the later half of the work week, but then much better conditions and improvements as we head into the weekend. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Bree Guy. I'm Jeff Bennett. Tonight on the News Hour, Israel accepts responsibility for a strike that kills seven World Central kitchen workers delivering aid in Gaza. That's at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Artist Tara Arunsakul has a new solo exhibit on view in Logan Heights. It's an immersive maze that explores assimilation, the American dream, and racism. KPBS arts producer and editor Julia Dixon Evans takes us through the exhibit. With the sunlight behind it, Tara Arunsakul's massive suspended maze grows white and nearly translucent. A closer look reveals all sorts of strange found objects affixed to the white panels. There's tea bags, there's dried ramen noodles, there's human hair, but from afar it looks ethereal and delicate. I wanted to build an interactive maze. I think that's something that I've learned since I was in high school is um, given a canvas or any space is to take as much of it as possible and create as much of it as possible. The maze takes up plenty of space at the Athenaeum Art Center in Logan Heights and that crisp delicate white material is mostly toilet seat covers and tissue. The objects woven into and stuck to the maze represent assimilation particularly for Asian immigrants and their families and the balance they have to strike between pursuing a fragile, misleading American dream and hanging on to pieces of home. Arunsakul wants visitors to experience the unsettling conflict and disorientation of assimilation within the maze. And food is an undeniable part of the immigrant experience, anchoring families to both old and new lands. Food also serves to bring the art to a level that's easier to understand. I think that food is something that everyone can relate to. It's all over the maze. There's like some Lay's chips here that have like, it's Thai Lay's chips and it's things that we can identify with, but there's a lot of influence of every culture in every culture, I think. Nothing comes from nowhere. Arunsakul wanted the maze to speak to how susceptible American society is to racism in her own experience as a first generation Thai Lao American. Essentially, it's about um, structural racism and uh, personally speaking from my experience is uh, the the assimilation of Asian culture into uh, you know white American society and what that means for each narrative and so each sheet in this uh, maze kind of represents that as visitors make their way through the maze they'll see more prominent tufts of hair and even plastic cockroaches Arunsakul wanted to explore how anti-blackness has historically thrived in Asian American communities she knew this could mean a ramped up sense of discomfort the hair you see here is sort of um, I think it represents a lot of different things in different cultures, but I definitely think that hair is something that we all try to maintain um, in some certain way. So um, that kind of represents the anti-blackness too, is like something that we always have to check ourselves on. Tucked away within the maze are some altar-like groupings. There's loose white rice and sculptures on the floor with suspended sculptures hanging above them. These groupings were inspired by the formation of rock and caves and the way minerals are redeposited, and they interrupt the flow of the maze. Structural racism um, sort of goes unseen um, unless you're confronted with it directly or affected by it. Irene Sickle shares a North Park studio space with a handful of other artists. There, works in progress hang alongside previous sculptures, like a life-size pig carcass constructed from paper. Her studio is tidy, but bursting with creativity and color. When asked how she knows her work is complete, she reflects on the process of making the maze panel by panel, 48 giant panels in total. When it's done, it'll tell me, because if I just keep on working on one the whole time, I will never be done with it. Christopher Padilla manages the Athenaeum Art Center Gallery and curated the exhibition. He said that Arun Sokol's art is both alluring and in your face. It was nice to be able to bring it in here and just blow it up to a scale where you are forced as a viewer to 
essentially walk through a massive piece. As unsettling as some of the installation is, the beauty in Arunsicle's work is not unintentional, and it's not beside the point. I think that a lot of people need things to be um, sort of picturesque so they could digest it a little bit more. And I think that per my purpose of this uh, installation is so people could be engulfed and feel comfortable enough. Like I said, I use household items so people would be more open-minded to step in. Julia Dixon Evans, KPBS News. Some fascinating work there and the exhibit is on display now through May 3rd. For more stories just like this one, you can check out our Spring Arts Guide. There you'll find our picks for the best art and culture in San Diego, including visual art, theater, dance, music, and literature, and even some picks for kids. Just go to kpbs.org slash Spring Arts Guide. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on NPR's Morning Edition. New York City hopes new rules will allow more cargo bikes to be used for deliveries instead of large trucks. And KPBS Midday Edition is talking with the co-editor of the World Happiness Report about the U.S.'s lowest ever ranking. Plus, how do we even measure happiness? And you can find tonight's stories on our website kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you.